So uh, Adrian uh, Plunkett is a consultant pediatric, uh, pediatric intensivist at Birmingham Children's Hospital. Um, and um, uh, that, that's not the only thing I'm sure, Adrian, that defines you, but uh, it, it's one of your many roles. And um, uh, he's also, uh, I think, a, a, the founder of, of the uh, idea of learning from excellence in, in, in uh, the, the form that we're talking about today. Um, and I'm very keen to hear about his experience of, of, of uh, really how he, I think, came to that conclusion that, that learning from uh, excellence was, was uh, so important. Um, and um, Adrian and I worked together many years ago in, in Great Ormond Street. Uh, we were uh, registrars there together, uh, fellows in, in the PICU, and uh, I went off to do general pediatrics. And Adrian, you decided that PICU was the career for you. And, and um, just tell us a little bit about your work and, and um, uh, you know, where you went after Great Ormond Street that time. You, 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 you went and took some journeys around the world. Yeah. Hi, John, and hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I did my uh, registrar training in Great Ormond Street, and some of which overlapped with you, John. In, I'd already decided on a career in paediatric intensive care by then. I guess I followed it through, went off to Melbourne for a year, came back um, to London, and then I've ended up in Birmingham, which was always a place I thought I would like to end up based on the, the ge geographical location. It's near um, my wife's family and uh, a, a, a great mix in terms of the clinical work for what I wanted to do. And I haven't looked back since then. I, I mean, it's, it's a, actually quite a progressive trust and it welcomes innovation. And I, I, I naturally fit into the kind of innovator. Like that's one of my strengths, I think, is, is new ideas, curiosity, um, trying out new things. And it's a good, it's a good place for me to work because they let me do things like that. Yeah, great, and and uh, that's a big PICU, is it? I mean, the, you've um, lots of colleagues and lots of patients. Yeah, it's big. I wonder sometimes, but maybe too big because you have, in order to make the most out of your team, it helps if you know each other well. And we are, yeah, a very big team for thirty. Actually, just opening thirty-one beds now. So wow. for PICU, that's pretty big. Um, and yeah, many, many members of staff, I think almost 300, maybe even be as many as 400, if you include um, every um, uh, member of the team. And Adrian, I suppose along the way, when, when did the idea of learning from excellence kind of, you know, stick out to you as being something uh yeah. you know that, that was needed i mean so, so many of these ideas in many ways you might say are, are common sense but they're not mm. commonly practiced mm. no that's right i mean they say the problem with common sense is not that common um yeah uh, that the idea it's not a new idea is it to to recognize what's working and to try and build on that and provide positive feedback these are not new concepts uh, although seemingly relatively new to healthcare because we're so focused on diagnosis and fixing problems. And and we tend to be populated by people who believe in that philosophy. And that is the nature of our business. Although actually we do really believe in making people better and and flourish, you know, being able to flourish and thrive. So, so I think actually it is there for all of us, this idea of going beyond just restoring the deficits and actually building on what's really working well. It's just, it needs to be unmasked or untapped. Um, so the, yeah, I mean, the, it, I, I always, whenever I talk about learning from excellence, I almost always tell the origin story, which was I had an experience as a patient or several experiences as a patient. And, and that sort of opened my eyes, but that is a retrospective analysis, if you like, of where the idea came from. It seems like the most obvious thing was that I, I noticed things were working at the time because I can remember being a patient and actually seeing things working and I wrote this letter and it wasn't received <laughs> you know a letter of gratitude and compliment it wasn't received by the people it was intended for and I th I thought that was probably the main tipping point for making this a, a reality but actually I think I think all the way through my life I've always realized there's something missing in our approach to improvement and education and just society in general, you know, all the way through to justice and 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 then the the working in healthcare and 
as I say, education, these, these things where we can bring about change. I've, I've always thought there's something missing. And this, for me, is the kind of main missing piece. And when did you when did you realize that that you would you'd have to do something to to make this happen? I think to bring this idea, you know, to to bear. I, I think the main call to action was, uh, as I just implied earlier, there was this moment after I'd had this experience as a patient a couple of years passed, and I met one of the individuals who, for whom I'd written a positive sort of appreciative letter, and discovered that he hadn't received it. Um, and then that, yeah, that was the moment when I thought we should actually turn this into something. Um, and then it, it was, that was the main tipping point. And then, and then I also, I was involved in, um, a serious adverse incident as a, a doctor, so part of a team that made a fairly significant mistake. And then, and I realized that the way out of this to make things better was to focus on what we could do to to improve more than just achieving compliance. Actually, what can we do to make a change? And I, I realized that the change I was leading for that was all, it was all based on, on what we do successfully um, and building on it. So those two things put together, I think, made me go to our governance team and our leadership in our hospital and say, why don't we just create a system where people can write down what's working? Have I heard you talk about this before? I think you got some good advice from your daughter. Was that that the the the, the time that that she gave you some good what to do? Yeah, that was actually that was another incident, but it was the same approach. Yeah, I I, I was involved in, in another incident, as we are in, inevitably in our jobs. We we despite trying our best, sometimes the best isn't good enough, and and patients come to harm, or they or they nearly come to harm. Um, as a result of things that could be better. And I, after one of those, I said to my daughter, she was six at the time, I said, um, I just sort of spilled it out. It was on my mind. I just said, look, I made this mistake. What do you think I should do? And she made, she wrote me a little checklist. So when I came back from going out to see some friends, there was a little checklist on my desk and it was, it was things like say, sorry, which, <laughs> which is, you know, it's a professional duty of candor yeah. that we have, but this was, say sorry and mean it you know because you do feel sorry so just say sorry and then say we won't do this again which is a nice point it went all the way through the checklist and the final point which i thought was wonderful was um ask for forgiveness and that is the that is the other half of apology that we often don't talk about it's not mentioned in any duty of candor guidance for example um it's hard we, we shouldn't expect our patients to forgive us yeah. but we should, I think, have a society where that is part of it's it's the end of the apology is the forgiveness. Okay, let's move on. It doesn't mean it's okay. It just means, yeah, something bad happened and we're gonna move on. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. And and uh, yeah, children are so smart sometimes and uh, so uh, <laughs> so able to see it all for what it is. Um yeah. so, so Adrian, I mean you you know, you, you had this realization that that we weren't perhaps learning from excellence, but how did you start to kind of turn that into rather than a catchphrase or a nice idea into mm -hmm. into an action and into change? Yeah, so we thought because it came from because I was working in an environment where we're very good at reporting. So we had a very high sort of and still do have very high prevalence and, and engagement with incident reporting. It's intensive care. It, it, yeah, we tend to be quite focused on marginal gains, fixing things that are just, you know, obviously erroneous. So, and we have a pretty well established governance team. And I think that is actually a, a key part. I think that needs to be in place before you can really get going with learning from excellence. But because that existed, I thought, well, why don't we just, if, if you ask people, they are seeing something good, they're likely to be able to report it because they're so engaged with reporting. So we, we, we just thought that'd be the best practical way of doing this spoke to the governance team, they agreed. And the, the one thing we wanted to change was to make it easy to report excellence rather than having lots of boxes to fill. We just had a very simple, you know, who did something excellent? What did they do? Describe that pretext qualitative description. And then if you can think of learning from this, then please share that too. Um, 
but that the the biggest part of it is just online simple reporting what you know what happened just describe it and that's fed back that's that was the other important part we we made sure that this was practically fed back to the individuals or the teams as fast as possible and we feed it back it's not anonymous but it's private feedback so you get it in an, you, in our institution you get it in email most places i think use email um some are on paper or cards um and that that i mean may get into that later or people in the chat may have views on that but we we've, we've always kept it as private feedback rather than sort of notice boards and competition uh, league tables that sort of stuff and what was the experience when when people started to get that feedback and and um get these messages yeah i mean the when we first started, we didn't do any top-down launching. We just started writing the reports. And the very first report, well, I actually, I wrote the first report, which is for one of our registrars who did a very good job of managing a patient with um, sepsis. But the, the second report was a report out of, the organ out of our team. And I thought, since we were doing this as a pilot in one department, you would expect all the reporting just to be within the team. But actually, the, set, the very second report was for, uh, I think it was the theatres team in neurosurgery who brought a patient to us, and we sent out some appreciation to them for what the, for some aspects of their care. And yeah, the vibe from that was was good, and I realised ah, that one of the benefits of doing this is it improves your relationships, and actually, it sort of to use a cliche breaks down silos a bit because we tend to work more and more in discrete bundles of, of group of groupings um so this facilitated some sort of i guess it's it's this intangible enhanced relationship you get um and then, and then a very early report right from the start was for a member of the corporate team um in trust and i can't recall the details but i do recall hearing that she burst into tears when she read the report and this wasn't for uh, negative reasons. This was for just yeah. a, a, a sudden appreciate, sudden realization that she was appreciated in her role, for, and for the first time, it had been articulated in a long time. So they, they don't always uh, result in sort of that degree of uh, positive um, ripple or, or positive impact, but they are almost always well received. I mean, I suppose there's the occasional cynic who comes across one that just thinks this is condescending or why are you sending me this but honestly we've had over 10,000 and I follow up a lot of them and, and they are yeah they are just well received yeah and you know I think I think people are probably surprised you know by because mm. this this is perhaps the stuff that again people think but they just never they never say it and and it's all the stuff that well, they probably know that anyway, but but maybe they don't, yeah. and they certainly don't I, hear it. I think they. That's interesting. So, uh, having been doing this for a few years now, I find myself now doing more and more face-to-face -face positive feedback. Um, there's something about writing it which adds some validity or changes the way it's received, and I think that is fundamentally very important, and continue to promote that. But the vision, if whenever I think about it really is that we just live in a society where there's more sincere positive feedback all the time um has to be sincere that's key but I I find myself yeah as I say just actually now just saying to people often in private so I was I was working with a junior doctor registrar recently and he, his his handovers were excellent and I was thinking I'll, I'll write this down in a report so he can reflect on it understand what it was that I like about it um, build on that strength, put it in his portfolio, etc. But I also just waited for everyone to leave the room, took him to one side and said, that's excellent. What, you, what you're doing there is really good. Keep building on that. And that, that's something that's coming a bit more into my practice, that sort of one-to-one -one private positive feedback. coming. It comes from the heart. You know, I'm not doing it in front of a big team saying, look at this yeah. guy is doing a great job. This is just one-to-one -one, um yeah, I think mean, there's a French proverb I think that says uh, all all people need is bread and praise. I think. Uh, nice. Um, nice. And 
and, and well, praise there. There's that, that. That's another thing that you've done, isn't it? That that was a project you did to to take um, appreciative inquiry and and other ideas along with learning from excellence to addressing prescribing. I think wasn't that something you you, you took on? Yeah. Yeah, so we, this is an interesting story because we, after doing LFE for a couple of years, there was a small number of skeptical people. I would say they're skeptical. There's probably some cynics in there as well, but appropriately skeptical people saying, how do you know this is making any difference? And it always felt very intuitive to me that the question didn't really need to be asked because it was already intuitively answered for me. But of course, that's just my perspective on the world. So I quite like a bit of science. I'm curious, you know, I'm interested in knowing how the world works. And I thought, well, why don't we design a study where we can actually measure something that changes in response to positive feedback within our context? So not this is a kind of psychological study, but this is actually in real life in as it happens in pediatric intensive care. So we did. So we came up with a study which is positive reporting and appreciative inquiry in sepsis and stewardship it turned into more of an antibiotic stewardship project because that's a big part of sepsis management and that that is praise that's what the praise stood for so yeah so we what what and then and we found that if you give people positive feedback again using that model it's private positive feedback it's descriptive of what they've done and it explains why what they've done is helpful and we focused for this study we just focused on antimicrobial stewardship so that the, the good practice is well described if you if you go out there there is there is sort of established good practice for antimicrobial stewardship so we got that down we captured it when it happened we had a little grant so that we had some staff to help with this and then we did some appreciative inquiry as well so people if they were doing good practice they would receive a report from me or a member of the team, but they would also get a follow-up interview. And we use this thing, if there's time, we can talk about the elements of appreciative inquiry. But basically it's an intervention in itself. It enhances the positive feedback. It does other things as well, but that's seemingly what it's use, useful for. And then people just Im improved. They sort of, even though they're receiving feedback for doing something which was actually a normal part of work, they did more of that. Um, and we had you know, a positive outcome of that study. There was less antibiotic use. There was more um, good practice. And so that it started off as this idea that we would just demonstrate that you can get some quantitative impact of positive feedback because that answered that question. But then after we did that, I kind of realized, well, this is a whole new approach to QI. It's actually a, a an intervention that you can use in any improvement project, provided you frame it right at the start, you should be able to, you should be able to use a positive intervention. It could, it could go alongside a more deficit-based intervention, but it's, it's available. So now, yeah, a big thing for me for the next few years really is to develop that a bit further, to test it in different settings um, and to apply a research mindset to that question. Does this, does this work in QI in across the board? And, and appreciative inquiry has become something you've, I think, embraced as as a, a very complementary methodology and set of ideas and principles. Yeah. The so when we first started learning from excellence, we thought we would do something called a reverse series. A series, what you may use the same terminology. That there's different terminologies for this that's a serious incident requiring investigation so it goes by different names in different uh, organizations but we want to do a reverse one of those um, which we call iris because that's the reverse of siri and we we um we yeah we we kind of did a root cause analysis for the first one so we used root cause analysis we used the five whys approach like fish bones and uh it was really interesting actually it generated some some interesting insights or hypotheses about what makes success happen. But it felt a little bit limited or limiting. Um, it was hard to generate improvement ideas from it. And that may just have been the way we were doing it. But then, so we went looking for something else and we discovered appreciative inquiry through our searching and inquiry 
and um, and it seemed to fit. Again, it felt intuitive for me and other members of the team. But since we since we started doing it, we've got some training in it. There's a, a team called a company called Appreci Appreciating People that, are, that do really good training. They've done quite a lot since we engaged with them with in healthcare. Um, and it's yeah, the more you do fish inquiry, the more you sort of get a hang of it and you get a feel for it. It's based on this idea that you get answers to the questions that you ask. Very mm -hmm. simple idea, isn't it? But of course that's true. But then when you think about that, everything depends on what questions you ask. Um, so if your inquiry is all about the root cause of what went wrong or the root cause of what went well, you will get, you will find answers that point towards a root cause or several causes. Whereas if you ask questions about what went well and what could go better or what could be improved from now, what, what would the future look like if things were really excellent and how could we get to that from here? You're, you're asking completely different questions and you actually, and, People have to generate improvement ideas in order to answer those questions. It shows the importance, doesn't it, of, of taking time to think to think about the questions that we we were going to ask and and yeah. um, and picking picking good questions. Yeah, yeah. Language is so important, isn't it? It's limited language. It's only ever giving you a sort of um, pointing towards the reality that we live in you're always limited with language but it's important yeah it's if, if you frame your questions right and your answers then then it will take you in different directions we had one of our conferences wasn't sure if you were at this one john it was the 2020 just before the pandemic in birmingham with the theme yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. you made it up so the theme Last was um, of freedom <laughs> yeah that was around language so why language matters so we yes, yes, remember that. From, uh, well, many, many good talks on the impact of choice of language. Yeah. And and I, I suppose, you know, learning from excellence, appreciative inquiry, positive deviance, safety too. There's a, there's a lot of kind of uh, uh, different approaches, but, but, you know, mm. that stem from maybe the same root of, of, yeah you know, how important it is to, to really understand and study success. Um, and, yeah. and you brought those together in, in some degree, I suppose, are, are certainly that's been something the community has been doing. Yeah, I think so. I hope, I hope so. But the, well, I like to think, because there's all these different kind of names or nomenclatures for the methodologies, aren't there? And we like yeah. to break things down and um, put things in boxes. Um, I think and so that, that's and I'm the same. I have a natural preference to try and do that to understand things. But of course, actually, at some point, you have to just take a step back and look at the whole picture. I think there's a big overlap between how safety two is defined and how learning from excellence is defined. There's clearly overlap, but there are also clearly some differences. Um, same with safety one, you know, I think there is um, overlap and and there's all these other ideas like positive deviance is actually quite a well established concept and appreciative inquiry it all fits in there. Um, I think certainly a number of those positive approaches have an, are probably underpinned by positive psychology or there's some, probably some other concept that is yet to be defined, which is about being positive. Um, but I try. I try not to get nowadays. Try not to get too hung up on the nomenclature. Um, the thing. I mean, if the people in the audience are wondering how learning from excellence differs from safety too, I think that's one of the most important um, things to explain because they often get conflated as the same thing. Yeah. Um, and safety too is is about understanding the whole system, isn't it? It includes failure and includes success and includes just everything in between. I mean, can you have anything in between? Well, I think what it means is that failure takes many different shapes and success take, takes many different shapes. Often it's the same work that leads to both of those outcomes or either of those outcomes. Um, so safety too is all about really understanding everyday work, the work, the workarounds you 
do in order to achieve most of the time success. Um, so that includes understanding success because the majority of work is successful. But learning from excellence doesn't really pay much attention to the failures because there's an established system, if you like, for doing that, be it safety one or safety two. And learning from excellence is about understanding and reinforcing and recognizing, appreciating the things that work. Um, they don't have to be outstanding excellence. Um, perhaps if we were going to start the project again, we might have called it learning from success, but it's really excellence is really can be everyday excellence. Someone just doing their job, but they're doing it with a bit of flair or a bit of um, pro social um, sort of aspect to it. Uh, but the other important element of learning from excellence, which really differentiates it from safety two, is that it incorporates positive feedback. Um, and that is that is a key part of it. It's that you show people what they've done and why it was important, why it was good. Because often, often they have an inkling about it, or quite often they don't realise quite how impactful their work was. I've had quite a few over the years reports to myself where, when I've realised only after receiving the report that thing I did was really helpful. And so I'm going to just change my practice in response to that insight. Yeah, and I, I and I do think you, you, learning from excellence is is about making care better and safer. But I, I, I think it takes no shame in saying that it's also really about sustaining and nourishing the people who deliver that care and 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 the importance of looking after them. And and I, I you know, other groups within, I suppose, the community are uh you, you know the um, civility saves lives and and the importance of looking out and caring and and um mm -hmm. you know working together and and uh, doing that in in respectful ways yeah yeah it's definitely about it's definitely a, a kind of staff orientated intervention or initiative with the idea that the downstream effect of what we do to each other impacts on the patient. So obviously we're all in this yeah. business to make life better for the patients, but we can't, unless we get our house in order, we're not going to be able to do that um, to the best of our abilities. And yeah, the the parallels with civility saved lives are really well established and we work closely together. Um, we shared our last conference together. We've produced the podcast together um, because we, I think, share the same philosophy that if we treat each other well, we do a better job and therefore the patients experience a better outcome and we're all patients aren't we we all we all use the service that we yeah. work in um and and our loved ones do or, you know so we are really all in this together adrian i'm keen just to dip into the the, the chat i was unable to to mm -hmm. get into my chat there for a little bit but i can see it all now and and um I know we've lots of people people from from all over ireland and from the uk and and um uh, several people who are interested, obviously, in, in and and uh, uh, I think active participants in their own LFE communities here in Ireland. Yeah. Um, and I'm just kind of looking through kind of some uh, some of the, you know people's comments, uh, opportunity to learn when things go right, uh, um, rather than things go wrong. So this was in, a, in answer to our question. Mm. Um, uh, and I suppose I'm keen to know from people what you know what what LFE work people have engaged in here, and 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 maybe that's a question, Adrian, for you. I suppose in in QI we often think about you know one of the things about QI is a little knowledge really safe to apply, you know, and and um, uh, that 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 if you do small tests and small changes, you mm -hmm. know, you can you can learn as a practitioner. Um, I think that's fair enough to say about uh, uh, LFE and 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 uh, appreciative inquiry and these positive approaches as well. I think uh, you know the one, one of the things mm. people don't do them is because they fear they haven't had enough training or yeah. they're not qualified enough or their job role doesn't allow them to kind of do these things. But I, I think one of the, the nice things about these ideas is they can be really applied by anybody. Yeah. I, I I agree. I mean, I recognise that um, issue that sometimes comes up where 
people don't feel they can start doing something like LFE or AI because they haven't had enough training or they haven't got the infrastructure set up. I mean, I think I, I, as coming from an intensive care background, I, I'm quite familiar with the idea of standing at the bedside and trying stuff until it works, which is actually the QI. It's, you do PDSA on, on the patients and on the ward rounds and stuff all the time. And because intensive care is so, the feedback is so fast, you, you get an opportunity to build on what's working and stop doing what isn't working. So I think it felt quite easy for me. And as I said, at the start, I have a very progressive chief executive and the whole trust um, is pretty innovative, you know, pretty um, uh, supportive of innovation. So it was a lucky start for me. Um, but I, yeah, th this isn't really controversial. So anyone who is out there who is thinking, I'd like to do this, but I'm not sure I've got the confidence to do it. It's actually, you can't do any harm with, um, giving someone yeah. some sincere positive feedback and if the best way to start it is just to literally start writing the reports we have uh, on the learning from excellence web page there's an open reporting page so if you don't have access to it uh, in your own tr organization you can just use the online reporting page there and we'll make sure it gets to them um so yeah it, it's one of those just do it yeah things. yeah yeah and and learn by doing i think and and uh kind of feel your way into it and and uh I, you know i think i think from your stories that you know the reception is generally is generally uh well received um mm. so so some nice comments there so uh, from uh, mona baker here in tempest street so simple words like thank you and well done uh, mm. has a powerful impact on the staff um and and that's i think what gives people the energy to go the extra mile and um lots of nice ideas there the the success factor um uh that's uh, from lynn williams there um so but lots of ways of interpreting this and what what have you learned in working with the community adrian obviously this has gone way beyond uh piku and birmingham at this stage yeah i mean so we've sort of uh i, w I w hesitate to use the word built a community i think we've supported a community that is to use a cliche term, sort of organically developed. So, and I think there, in retrospect, you could have said this was by design because the idea was formed, as I said, not, not a new idea, but it was formed and kind of branded as Learning from X. And then initially it was me and that was a team of people just went out speaking at medical conferences. We were invited to do it all the time. We wrote a paper, the sort of white paper, which was like the description of how it works. And then we've developed uh, um, some several other research questions along the way, one of which was that praise project. So there has been, in retrospect, a kind of communication strategy to to develop a community of practice. And then we've got a website and social media channel and conferences, a blog, now the podcast. But none of this is really um, been, it, this, this hasn't really been carefully designed. This has been just um, put together because if we just want to support community so the, the we, we're hands off the tiller was one way it was described but we're just the, the way we're trying to lead this is by thought leadership we're not saying this is how you do it and as a result it's turned into a few different things so right at the start someone in our organization introduced me to our legal team and said do you want to get intellectual property protection for this we could develop a license and it, yeah that could potentially use for financial gain but also could just be used to protect it and we said no to both of those things because the spirit of this work is we just want to see a positive change in the world actually so actually let's be really ambitious here i'm talking about the whole world to society we just want people to give more positive feedback that is sincere to each other and so as a result yeah it's the, the lfe community press is, has there are little forms of lfe appearing uh, like a common word for it is gratix which was yeah. one, one of our trainees who worked with me who's now in leicester set up gratix and, and he yeah, spoke to me at the time said do you mind if i develop this call it gratix and that was totally fine you know and so, so that's it's, that's just that's a, an internet-based kind of way of making excellence reports isn't it it's a yeah it's just a, a name I and mean, people i think like there are names for things 
yeah. um, and I call it LFE. We we have the whole hub we call the whole community we call it LFE, but it's got tons of different names. Greatex is probably the most common second name for it, I suppose. But there's there's a whole host. It's, there's a nice one on the south coast called Kudos, which I think is quite nice. Um, but yeah, I'm happy with whatever people want to call it, so long as it sticks to the overall principles, which is we're capturing what's working and we're providing positive feedback for that. Fantastic. I'm just going to go back to our, our chat there and um, uh, some nice uh, Michelle Chunger. We used a QI approach to a maternity mm -hmm. team and we are now looking to scale up trust of recently purchased excellent recording module of the Ulysses safeguard system. Okay. So there's, again, like you said, there's lots of different kind of interpretations of this coming through and, and um, yeah, I mean, Ulysses uh, is one of the fairly well established incident reporting systems and they, they have um, created excellence reporting within Ulysses and they've, they cite um, some of our work in it. So yeah, that's all, that's all out there. Michelle's in uh, Blackpool, I think. Um, so actually one of the things you asked me, I didn't really answer your question, which is what do we learn from the community? I get lots of feedback from community members yeah. all the time. We, we, we started having these uh, Zoom calls, which I do uh, basically at my own availability. It's a, and and we've had five or six of those now and they some of them are just open chats a bit like we're having now but people come in with with things um different solutions to how to make it sustainable that was what we talked about last time um and um yeah always interested to know how people keep it going because it's currently in most places unfunded and unresourced and it may be that that's one of the next big steps is to get it actually recognized at a, at a very senior level um, in, and then resourced. It is actually recognized at a very senior level. It's in the National Patient Safety Strategy for uh, the NHS. It's in the, it's cited in things like the Ockenden reports has come out. It's, it's actually mentioned as something you, really? you okay. could do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it would be nice if funding followed that. Um, the risk, of course, there is that you may end up creating something that's regulated, and then that could kill the spirit of, of the initiative. Yeah. So there's always that tension. Um, but yeah, that's that's I think an ongoing discussion. Yeah, yeah, but I, like I think a lot, like a lot of these things, they do need, you know, they need some time and uh, people, you know, to to to, mm -hmm. I suppose, allow them develop, and especially when they get to this level and. Um, yeah, uh, yeah it does it does need it does take time um and it's time well spent and it's rewarding but inevitably you need to carve out time in your job plan and therefore ultimately it's going to need some resources uh i'm just looking at uh, there's a few more so on aqua um uh we have lfe and appreciate inquired together for our training programs so uh specifically focused on health and social care so these are you know, ideas that can be used really any part of the system. I mean, and probably yeah. in any system. Uh, I see my colleague there, Rob Cunney in Temple Street, who who has been a great advocate of, of both uh, LFE and uh, AI here um, in CHI. I, I I think many, if not most, of us practice some form of LFE in our daily lives. I think that's really mm, yeah. true. I think certainly any anybody who parents, I think, uh, yeah. has realised a long time ago that that that's. Uh, uh, the better way to connect with your your kids, but that but that's a good point because so parenting is a good example of this is that it it illustrates the fact that it takes effort. So you you're actually going against the grain a lot of the time, even though it's more effective to to give positive feedback and reinforce to catch people when they're doing it well, even if they're just doing it as they should be doing it. It takes a little bit of effort. It's against our innate negativity bias to try and correct things. And yeah, parenting is a, is a great example of that. But I think it's worth reminding people when they're doing this, you do need to put a bit of effort in in order to get the benefits. I see Rob has joined the panel there, actually. Rob, are you able to turn your camera on or? If you want to say something there. Hi Rob. Yeah, uh, connected. Yeah, no, I, yeah, no, I think, I think the, you know, they, they, I was sort of thinking about, you know, some of the, 
you know the areas as to say that we we, we kind of use this sort of approach you know uh, you know outside of of healthcare and it's and i agree it's it's not actually instinctive i don't think mm -hmm. you know it's you know the the it, it does you know, i think you're right adrian that it really it does it takes effort but you know i found with things like, i mean in parenting you know training the dog learning a musical instrument yeah. you know it, over time you realize oh actually hang on a second the approach of beating yourself up when you do something wrong you you don't actually make progress but the, the approach of going like oh hang on a second if i do this thing like if i keep this thing worked if i keep doing that you actually learn much faster and you know and, and it's a, you know it's, it's ultimately a much more um rewarding experience um and and i think that 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 thing of overcoming our inherent negativity bias is uh, I, I think that that uh, that can't be underestimated. I think that's a um, and, and I and I suspect that when you know, like when you ask the question at the start around, you know, do we learn more from when things go wrong rather than when things go right? And the, the, you know, and and the instinct is to say, oh, well, we you know that it's we learn equally from both. But I actually think that there's a bias within that. Mm, and yeah. it's, it's 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 kind of like when I'm riding my bike. And I give out about taxi drivers. Um, it's it's actually it's only because I'm aware of the taxis because they've got a big taxi sign on the on the you know so there's a you know there's a there's a, um there's a bias there that that uh, you know we we think that we learn more or or equally from when things go wrong because we automatically notice more when things go wrong. Uh, but I think if we actually force ourselves to stop and go no let's look at the things that go go right um it it is it is ultimately a much more rewarding uh, experience and and i think the psychology you know the behavioral psychology supports that as well in terms of the you know the 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 you know the 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 role of of positive rather than negative reinforcement yeah i agree yeah, as sure. my dog's barking in the background but i i think one of the reasons why we is we believe that learning from failure is so effective is that when you're trying to learn something new you will fail a lot more so it's just very prevalent but actually there's usually especially if you're learning a complex task because there are an infinite number of ways to fail so all you do each time you fail is you learn how not to do that particular failure again but the minute you get it right is a much much stronger learning experience you think about riding the bike being the classic example um, but the, and there is a literature, as you quite rightly say, Rob. There's literature out there being tested in various different domains. Some of it's really interesting and very creative. What these uh, cognitive scientists come up with ways of testing this. Well, Adrian, it's been a great chat. I think we could we could keep going for 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 a lot longer. Um, I, I'm sorry I didn't get to everything in the chat there. And there's been I, I would really encourage people just to look through the chat because there's been lots of lovely comments and. Lots of praise, Adrian, for for LFE, and I think uh, it's really tapped into something that I think has a, a deep, you know, resonance with a lot of people. I think, um, uh, and people are enjoying it, uh, you know, as something very complementary to, I think, safety approaches and QI. Um, you have some wonderful resources. I mean, between obviously the, your websites, it, the, the, there's great things there. There's a blog. But the thing I've really enjoyed, and uh, in doing my a little homework for today, I was listening to the um, the podcasts, and I must say mm -hmm. they are really excellent. Um, I really enjoyed. Obviously, John Berwick was there, but but also some of your colleagues um, uh, from from Birmingham, and and uh, the uh, the one with Lindsay Godwin from mm -hmm. the um, uh, AI. I thought that was if, if you really wanted to get. A handle on what AI is and and what maybe it can do for you. I thought that was a great introduction to AI. Yeah, thanks. Those podcasts are, are great fun. We did we created them because we did these short recordings for our last conference, which is a virtual conference. But we realised we'd recorded much longer conversations that need that deserve to be shared. Um, so that was the idea behind the podcast. So they're longer form conversation there's a couple more to come out on this season we've taken a little break just while we're doing some editing and uh, there will be we think we'll do a second season because there are lots of people we've got lined up that we'd like to have conversations with 
Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. I particularly like the one with Dr. Uh, uh, Glaucom Flecken as well. I think he's he's really got a big yeah. following here in Ireland too. And and um, yeah, and I think it's nice to to see humor and fun, you know, coming into this work as well. And and I suppose that idea of of restoring the joy in work, you know, that that mm -hmm. work should be a joyous thing. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. No, he he was great. Uh, all the guests have are brilliant but very generous of him he's unbelievably busy i think um they're very generous of him to give us a little interview yes and i imagine you are too and i imagine probably with the success of lfe you're probably asked to uh to do lots of talks and and um uh, lots of interviews yeah quite a lot of talks um and we as i say it's not just me now there's a few others who do it and we try and say yes to all of them but inevitably they clash with rotors and things um, but the mission is to get get it out there and 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 influence and make a positive change so it's a pleasure doing it super well look with the slide there up uh you know we have the uh your website and the blog is there um uh one of our colleagues here professor mary higgins did a a, a nice piece with the medical yes. students i think it was in uh, in dublin a few years ago uh, on learning from excellence uh, we put up our own kind of a human factors guide. That might be something uh, you might be interested in. It was it was written by colleagues in human factors here uh, for healthcare um, uh, staff. Um, any other resources? Anything you tap into, Adrian, on a on a regular basis within healthcare or outside of it to to inspire you? Uh, well, I suppose I'm interested in. It probably wouldn't be a surprise that I have an interest in psychology, uh, broadly speaking how we make decisions, how we think, what motivates us. So I just read a lot of nonfiction books on that topic and delve into that literature. It started off with Kahneman, I think Daniel Kahneman's work. And then I realized, oh, we've got this really fallible brain that is very, um, well, mind, which is influenced by all sorts of things going on. So yeah, and I just, I've read hundreds. Maybe I should publish a, um, reading list of books i've read for those yeah well i you know i think i think i think uh, yeah th th i think it's always good to know what other people uh, are, are reading to see where they get their ideas from and uh, mm. but Adrian, it's been a real pleasure i thank you very much i think um i'm just going to give a, a a quick shout out to um uh, uh is the next slide there uh noemi and Is it, can we bring up the next slide, please? I think it's on there. It's, it's up here. Can you have you lost? Oh, it's up. Okay, no, it's just not coming. Oh, there it is there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Super. No worries. Thanks, Noemi. Uh, so this is just a flag. Um, um, uh, our uh, publication that the, the uh, Oxford um, uh, Handbook of Patient Safety has just come out, edited by um, uh, Peter Lackman and Jane Ronicles, Anita Javeda and uh, John Brennan and myself. Uh, and we have a chapter there from Adrian um, uh, on uh, learning from success. And uh, he talks lots about um, learning from excellence and, and all those other things we've talked about today. So. Uh, that's available uh, to buy from Oxford University Press, um, and uh, hopefully it'll be in, in good bookshops soon. But uh, it really is a very practical approach to patient safety, um, and I hope people will uh, will get a chance to look at that. Uh, next slide there. Uh, so again, just just uh, encourage people just to uh, uh, register yourself on the uh, QPS uh, uh, network uh, map. Let us know where you are, what you're doing um and and keep connected with us and um uh, and, and then kind of watch out for things that are going on including talks like today next slide there and q community um so uh certainly uh, encouraging people to check out q learn about q our colleague uh, caroline lennon nally whose email is there uh, is available for queries um, and we would really encourage people to join Q and um, uh, again I think LFE is another nice example of something that that's gone across you know uh, certainly the UK and Ireland um, uh, but even across the the, the, the world 
so again, that community of Q, I think, is a great way of share, sharing and learning about uh, uh, ideas like this. And then just to uh, put a date in your diary, please. So uh, we'll be joined in a, a couple of weeks' time by Katrina Heffernan uh, from Cork. Uh, and uh, Katrina uh, is going to talk about the overlap between innovation um, and uh, uh, she's a, a, a lead for the Spark Innovation Program. Um, so we're going to talk about innovation and QI and, and where the two meet and, and the synergies there. And I'm really looking forward to that conversation too. So Adrian, thank you once more. And uh, uh, it's been a pleasure catching up with you again. I hope we get to do it in person sometime soon. Yeah, thanks very much. It was, it was uh, my pleasure. Super, thank you. And folks, if you could just let us know how, uh, how uh, the webinar was today, and if you have any feedback or ideas or things you'd like to see in the future, please uh, do include that in your feedback. And we look forward to seeing you in a few weeks time. Thank you very much.